So now we are moving to the greedy method, uh, which is one of the most important um, methods in algorithm design that uh, despite its simplicity uh, can solve a, a remarkable uh, number of uh, practically important uh, problems. So as it names, name says it, um, uh, the greedy method tries to make an optimal choice locally at every stage of the construction. It looks what's the best move at that step with, uh, by, and ignores uh, what happens on a global scale, right? What happens with the whole construction. And as we will see, sometimes this approach works, but sometimes we need a truly global approach, um, such as dynamic programming, but uh, we will see this uh, a bit later. So let's take a, a typical example of a problem that is successfully tackled by the greedy method. So assume that you have a list of activities, right? Uh, pictured here. So each activity has its uh, uh, starting uh, moment and its uh, finishing moment. So you can think of a classroom like this and then a whole bunch of people apply to do lectures in the classroom like this and they give you uh, the starting time and the finishing time of their lectures, right? And your task is to choose a, a largest size set of uh, non of compatible activities, right? So you want to accommodate as many people as possible, but of course uh, their lectures should not overlap. So once again, we are looking not to maximize the total duration of all activities, non-conflicting activities that, they will, that will take place, but just the number of activities uh, um, that will take place. Uh, later we will see how to handle a more tricky problem when you actually want to maximize the length of activities, uh, total length of activities. If you charge, for example, per minute uh, or usage of a classroom, then you would want to um, maximize the total duration, right? But in this case, we only want to maximize the total number of activities that can take place and that are non-conflicting uh, with each other. So let's try, you see, one of the biggest, the trickiest part in a greedy algorithm algorithms is to find uh, with respect to what quantity you should act in a greedy way, namely what should you try to kind of locally optimize. Uh, and sometimes it's not completely trivial to see uh, what this should be. So let's see first, let's make attempt a reasonable um, uh, a, a reasonable approach is because you want to maximize the total number of activities. Uh, you want to pick as short activities as possible because in this way you will be able to fit as many of them as possible, right? So that sounds uh, like a logical uh, thing to try to do, right? But unfortunately, this does not work. Here is an example. So um, you start by picking the shortest possible activity, that would be this first green one. Then you would eliminate uh, the conflicting activities, which would be these two red activities. Then you would choose uh, the um, uh, shortest available next activity, right? Uh, that. Um, uh, and uh, in this case, you would end up choosing these two activities while, as you can see on this picture, one can actually choose uh, three non-conflicting activities rather ju uh, than just uh, two. So picking the shortest ones, even though it sounds uh, 
tempting and logical actually doesn't solve the problem. So, well, um, another attempt would be uh, among the non-conflicting activities uh, um, with the activities previously chosen, we should always choose the one with the earliest possible start date so that the waste of time between chosen activities is uh, minimized, right? This, is also, this also sounds uh, reasonable, but lo and behold, as you can see here, uh, if you choose uh, in the first attempt, you start with the earliest starting activity. If it happens to be a very long activity, it will rule out all of these and you will end up with a suboptimal choice, right? So this also does not work. So uh, another tempting strategy would be at each point uh, you choose the activity that conflicts with the smallest number of other activities, uh, right? Because uh, one can argue if you do such, if you make such a choice, then the number of activities that you will have to eliminate as conflicting with the chosen activities will be minimized and you will be consequently left with a larger number of activities to choose from, right? Unfortunately, this does not work either. So, for example, on this picture, the first activity you would choose according to this strategy is this middle activity because this activity conf conflicts with only two other activities, while all other activities conflict with uh, uh, three activities. Now, once you choose this activity, you have to eliminate the, the activities conflicting with that one, so these two. And then you are, cho uh, you are left with four activities on the left and four activities on the right. They all uh, conflict with the same number, namely three activities, and you can choose arbitrarily. And unfortunately, as you can see on this picture, this obviously fails to be an optimal solution. So, because if you choose the first activity, the third activity, um, so if you, so in this, in this situation, right, uh, you will be choosing only three activities while actually this, you can also choose these four non-conflicting activities and have a better solution. So what do you think? What property, how should you choose the activities in a way that uh, is guaranteed to produce an optimal solution? What are the activities that truly minimally limit your subsequent choices? Uh, what would be the criterion, correct criterion to try to optimize in a greedy way here. Exactly. So the trick is to choose the activity with the earliest finishing time. Right? So here is an example. Among all these activities, this green activity is the one that finishes earliest. Right, so you would choose this one and eliminate the conflicting activities, which are these three red. Then among the leftover activities, again you look with the, for the one that finishes earliest, and that's this activity on the bottom, so you eliminate these two. And moving here, so this is what we chose so far. After you eliminate these conflicting activities, you see this activity starts earlier but finishes later. So you will choose this activity because among non-conflicting activities, activities that do not conflict with the previously chosen ones, this one has the earliest finishing time and so forth, right? Now, who can guarantee that the maybe with some clever choice, uh, just like in previous examples, we can end up in some circumstances with a suboptimal solution, right? 
Now, this is the place where a little bit of kind of mathematical approach helps. Namely, I wouldn't call it, uh, uh, it's really not a proof, but a, an informal but rigorous justification, right? So students often ask what is the, what constitutes a good justification? It doesn't have to be formal involving some calculations, but it has to be rigorous. And when you read the justification, you are convinced that the solution is correct, right? So it's a kind of practical criterion. So let us see how you would prove that the strategy that this gentleman proposed, in fact, produces an optimal solution. And this is one of the most typical methods how to do it. And for reasons that you will soon appreciate, it's sometimes called cut and paste method. So how do we, we show the following. Um, you assume that there exists a better solution than the one that was provided by the greedy method, right? Then you morph <coughs> this better solution step by step into a solution that eventually becomes the greedy solution without decreasing the uh, quality of the solution. In this case, we will morph a quote-unquote better solution by uh, re replacing certain activities in such a way that progressively we make it closer and closer to being a greedy solution until at the very end we get exactly the greedy solution without decreasing the number of activities. And this is a contradiction because we assume that that solution is better than the greedy solution, but we actually show that it can at most be as good as the greedy solution. So how do we proceed? Well, if there is a better solution than the greedy solution, obviously it is not designed by the greedy strategy, which means that if you try to apply a greedy solution to your problem, at certain step, you will reach a situation in which the, that better solution um, uh, uh, contradicts the greedy. It's distinct from the greedy choice, right? Because if it is not the greedy solution, eventually you have to find a step in which greedy was, uh, um, was violated, right? So let's see, this is a purportedly uh, better solution. We want to turn it into the greedy solution. The first choice obviously complies uh, with greedy, right? Because this activity is uh, the first ending activity, right? activity that finishes earliest. So this choice is in fact compatible with the greedy choice. Then we we'll go to the next choice. Now clearly at this stage greedy is violated because the red activity finishes earlier but we chose the green activity that finishes later. So now what we do, and this is why it's called cut and paste, so we simply cut out uh, uh, this activity and replace it with the one that is chosen according to the greedy strategy. Okay. Now we have to show that if we do that, this will be still a valid solution with equal number of activities chosen. So can you tell me why replacing this uh, activity here with activity on the top, why, why uh, does it still produce a valid solution? Why can be, there can be no overlaps between the activities? <coughs> exactly. You see, the activity that we choose 
finishes earlier, finishes before the previous activity, previously chosen activity. So if previously chosen activity that lasts after that moment did not overlap with any subsequent activities, then clearly activity that finishes before that activity will also be compatible, will be still uh, provide a set of uh, compatible activities. Uh, simply because we are replacing activity with the later finishing date with one with the earlier finishing date. Uh, so there can be no conflicts on the left because we choose the first activity non-conflicting with the previously chosen ones. And on top of it, one that uh, finishes earliest because uh, now any other activity can be replaced with this activity and still preserve compatibility, right? So then we look at the uh, next chosen activity, right? Uh, well, uh, this here, again, the choice is not consistent with greedy because this little red activity finishes earlier than the green activity, so we replace this red activity, we take this earlier finishing activity and drop that activity. Now, clearly, because we always just replace one activity by another activity, the total number of chosen activities does not drop. It remains the same. And doing this uh, iteratively, you can finally uh, re uh, re uh, get rid of all conflicts with the greedy strategy, and the last activity is precisely greedy activity. But this means that the starting solution had to have uh, uh, at most as many uh, chosen activities as the greedy solution. So you see, this is obviously a, a rigorous argument, maybe informal, but uh, because we didn't write any formulas, but the argument is rigorous and shows that, in fact, uh, this way uh, that greedy produces optimal solution. Notice that uh, uh, this is important because very often as in these previous examples, uh, it looks very natural to always choose activity that uh, conflicts with the fewest number of other activities, but it doesn't work. So in order to see that your algorithm does work, it produces the desired solution, you have to give a justification, an informal justification, but one that shows uh, 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 rigorously that your activity is, uh, that your uh, solution is optimal. Now, sometimes in some greedy uh, solutions, the optimality will be obvious, uh, and you will not, just from the definition of the algorithm, you can see uh, that the solution is optimal, and then, of course, you, there is nothing to prove, but uh, as soon as the problem is a little bit tricky, the only way to see that your solution is correct is to give a rigorous proof of its correctness. Right? So did you understand the argument here? Yes? So this happens to be the case that the initial choice ends up with the same uh, number of SFTs. Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is a very good question. Does this give you a recipe to prove, uh, to generalize this proof to all greedy proofs? Unfortunately, it doesn't. How do we, so uh, it's, you see, this is why argo algorithm design is a skill. Sometimes one thing works, sometimes another thing works. In fact, it's impossible to give a rigorous criterion, even though there were many attempts in the past. It's impossible to give uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, criterion when greedy will work. So how then do you know you should use greedy? Well, you give it a try. And if you succeed, fine. If you don't, you think about another method. But there are no recipes. However, you see, 
It's just like going to a, see a doctor and you tell him your symptoms. And most of the time he can tell what's wrong with you. How is it possible? How does he do that? Well, the reason is that he has seen probably a hundred people before you with exactly the same complaint. The same applies to algorithm design. After you practice it enough, you get a gut feeling. Unfortunately, it's just a gut feeling, but you get a gut feeling what might work. And you try, and if you fail, you try something else. But, um, so our algorithm design is a bit of a kind of an art rather than just a science, right? But you eventually, you pick up what you should use, uh, but you just be careful and always give a, a rigorous justification that your solution is correct. Let's see another activity selection problem. So this time, you are also given a bunch of activities but they are this time all of the same duration, right? The duration is D. And this time you want to maximize the total duration of uh, all activities. Uh, how would you solve this problem? If all activities are of equal length, how would you choose uh, uh, activities so that the total, sum total of their duration is as large as possible. Sorry? It's the same greedy algorithm. Because if all activities are all of the same duration, maximizing total duration means simply maximizing their number. Right? So when you get a new problem, and in fact on an exam if I get a new quote-unquote problem, think carefully if this is reducible to something that you have already seen. Very often it in fact happens that one problem is easily and directly reducible to another that you have already solved. Okay, so you would simply apply the previous algorithm. Now, another example of the greedy strategy. So you have to minimize job lateness, right? So assume that you have a starting time and a list of jobs with duration times of each job and the deadline DI. Say these are, the jobs are your assignments, right? And you didn't start doing them on time. Each assignment has a deadline that you have to submit it, otherwise you get penalty for being late. And you know how long it will take you to finish each of these uh, assignments. What you want to do is you have to find in which order you will do all of these assignments so that the lateness, that the maximal lateness among all the late assignments is as small as possible. Right? So you'll schedule your uh, in which order you will complete your assignments, right? Then you look uh, how late you will be, if at all, for each of these uh, assignments. And then you want to make sure that the largest lateness uh, among these assignments is as small as possible, right? This is a tricky problem for one strange a reason, uh, and, but it's a kind of a very good example that sometimes <coughs> in your problem, you in order to kind of precisely describe your problem, you might have taken into account irrelevant facts. Namely, what we are going to show is uh, that if you ignore totally the length, how much time it takes for you to finish an assignment, 
and just consider their deadlines, then if you order them, if you order all the jobs according to, in order of their deadlines, right? In order of their deadlines, then um, this will minimize the largest lateness. Right, so the solution is ignore job durations and schedule jobs in the increasing order of their deadlines. Now we want to prove optimality of this solution. Well, again, assume there is a better solution. If, <coughs> if it's not done, by following the greedy strategy that takes into account the deadlines, then at one point, there must be two uh, assignments such that the deadline of assignment J is before the deadline of assignment I, but uh, you... Um, Right, so the deadline here, but you actually scheduled the activity di, the activity i, before the activity j. Right, so this would mean that the greedy principle was violated. Right, because here the activity i is has the deadline after the deadline of activity j, but it was scheduled to be done before the activity J. Now we will call that these two activities or these two jobs form an inversion. Right? Now the trick is we are again going to massage this solution into the greedy solution, so a solution in which the activities are ordered in the order of their deadlines, increasing deadlines, right? Without in ever increasing the maximal laten lateness, right? Well, to do that, we, it's good to recall the bubble sort algorithm. How does bubble sort work? You go through your array, and wherever you see an inversion, you swap. And you keep doing that, and eventually you end up without any inversions. The reason for that is that if there exists an inversion, you can try to come up with a rigorous argument that then there must be an inversion of two adjacent activities. So if there are inversions at all, then there must be two activities that are adjacent with an inversion. The easiest way to see that is think of bubble sort because the argument is easiest, right? Assume that there exists an inversion and try to show that if you move uh, towards the kind of between these two inversions that eventually you will have to find an adjacent inversion. Um, so, if we, so this means that if we keep swapping inversions uh, that are adjacent, eventually we are going to end up with inversion-free uh, schedule of activities, right? Just as for exactly the same reason uh, as uh, the reason that bubble sort uh, works. So, um, let's see how we do that. So, assume that we have uh, two activities that are out of order because the first activity, the activity uh, di has a later deadline than the activity uh, i plus one, but uh, the activity i was scheduled before the activity i plus one, even though, as I say, 
activity I plus one actually had earlier deadline. Now we just swap these two activities. Now notice nothing before the two activities and nothing after these two activities changes. And that's the reason why we operate only on adjacent activities. Otherwise, if the inverted activities are apart, if you swap them, everything moves a little bit and it's hard to see uh, why the maximal lateness doesn't increase. And this is a very common trick. As you will see, we will use it many times. If we want to rectify things that are out of order, we always rectify things that are adjacent and out of order, right? And then bubble sort guarantees that eventually there will be no inversions. So nothing, if they are adjacent, nothing to the left of activity i and nothing to the right of activity i plus one changes, right? Now, if you swap the two activities, then the lateness of activity I will increase, right? Why will it increase? Well, simply because, uh, sorry, the activity, yes, activity I will increase because now uh, the ending moment of the i activity will be pushed forward up to here, right? Where the ending moment of activity I plus one wants, was. But notice, because the deadline di is after deadline di plus one, there is a gap here. So this lateness, right, cannot be longer than the lateness of activity i plus one before. Because the ending point is the same, right? But in this case, the longest lateness starts from di not the i plus one, and so this will be still shorter than the lateness of activity i plus one here. On the other hand, the lateness of the um, activity i plus one will be reduced because now the activity i plus one finishes earlier because we swapped it, right? So it finishes earlier, so this activity uh, the lateness of this activity will be reduced, right? So now, so clearly, if you do this transformation, the total lateness, maximal lateness, cannot increase because uh, the bound for the, of both latenesses was uh, only decreased rather than, the, uh, rather than Fi plus one minus D i plus one, we have these two latenesses that are both of shorter duration than the lateness of the i plus one activity here. Uh, and so if you proceed to morph this solution, you will get eventually a solution that complies with the greedy solution, right? Uh, and thus the original a uh, solution couldn't have been with the shortest, ma with the lowest maximal latency uh, than the greedy solution. Now notice this swapping is not how the greedy algorithm works. It's just the argument in the justification that the greedy activity is optimal. How do we produce optimal solution? We simply take the set of activities <coughs> and we sort them according to their deadline, and we schedule them in that order. So this will be obviously just an n log n solution, right, because sorting will require n log n many steps. So keep in mind the distinction between the definition of the, your algorithm and uh, proof of optimality, and notice that sometimes proof of optimality goes, is kind of tangential to the definition of the algorithm, right? It involves steps that are not involved in the algorithm. Yes? Yes, 
So it increased. So the question is that one of the true latencies, right, this lateness here will become larger. But it cannot exceed the, uh, this lateness here, right, the lateness of activity I plus one. So it did increase, but it's still smaller than the, this lateness. So then maximal total lateness cannot be larger, right? Because in this way we replace, so in other, other words, max lateness here is larger than max lateness here, even though one of the two lateness is increased. But the larger of the two, their max decreased. Yes? Okay, so it is, uh, it, uh, so the question is how do I know that that uh, reduction is uh, more than the increase? Uh, I don't have to know that. Uh, I only have to know the following, that the longest total, the to longest lateness uh, did not increase. Uh, so in my operation, I did increase one lateness and decrease the other one. But the max of the two is still smaller here than here. So I only de decrease the max, even though some of them can increase in lateness, but their lat lateness cannot exceed the, the, largest, the larger lateness from the initial setup. So because now both this lateness is smaller than that lateness, and this lateness is not smaller than this one, but is smaller than the max. So here the max lateness is this, and both these latenesses are smaller than this max. So if I take max over all possible latenesses here, and all possible lateness is here, this max can be only smaller or equal than the original one. You understand this? How does that minimize lateness? Well, you minimize maximal lateness. You don't uh, minimize some total of latenesses. You just want to minimize the largest possible lateness. So, if you always keep decreasing, remember the definition, uh, you want to uh, schedule the job so that the lateness of the job with the largest lateness is minimized. So here we are minimizing the longest uh, uh, lateness, right? Not the sum or anything, we are just minimizing the max. And in each of these steps, max either remains the same or it drops. Why it can remain the same? Maybe this activity here was not with the maximal lateness. Maybe maximal lateness was somewhere here. So the maximal lateness remained the same. But the trick is the maximal lateness after the transformation cannot be larger than the maximal lateness of, original, of the original solution. Okay, as, uh, oops, what is this? Okay, we will, this is an old slide, oh my, let me, I thought this was, okay, so we will do them, we will do the problems in a little bit, I thought I, maybe the server didn't, uh, didn't update. Uh, we will do the problems in slightly different order because uh, in past years I assume that you are well familiar with the basic tree algorithms. For example, how to find maximum span spanning, minimum spanning tree and so forth. But apparently this is, I should not assume that I was told. So we will first do some basic uh, greedy problems, and then we will apply them to uh, three problems. So here is one uh, greedy problem. First, we will do a simpler version and then more complicated version. 
So in good old days, uh, before you were born, when I was learning computer science, we kept a large amount of data on what type of storage? Tape, Tape exactly. So you probably see it in uh, the movies, these huge cabinets that look like uh, big uh, uh, tape recorders, uh, and the files are just in an order on the tape, right? So in order to find your file, you have to scan from the beginning until you find the file, and then you can read it, uh, right? So you can see this was kind of uh, slow access uh, memory storage, right? Now you are given uh, n files, uh, that are equally likely that you will need them. In what order would you place them on the tape to minimize the average download time, the average search and download time uh, of the storage unit? Shortest first. How do we see that that's the correct solution. Well, what is the average search time? Well, for the first file, you immediately get to it and you read it, so the search time and download time will be, read time will be proportional to its length. Now, for the second file, you have to read, the, you have to go through the first file to find the beginning of the second file, so this will be the total time needed and so forth. And if you uh, put all the uh, L's of the same kind under one simple multiple, this is the expression that you get, right? And now, since the largest multiplier with, is with the first time, sorry, with the first file, clearly this expression will be minimized if uh, uh, L's are in increasing order, right? If the one that is uh, um, multiplied by N is the shortest one and so forth. Okay, so that was easy. But now the problem is this. Let's see another type storage. Now, it's the same tape uh, uh, storage unit and the same N files. But now the probability of needing that to read that par any particular file is different from file to file. So let's, let us denote by PI the probability that you will need uh, the, uh, type, uh, the file of length LI. Now again, you have to sort them you have to put them in such an order so that the expected time is as small as possible. Now, you see, the problem here is that you have two apparently conflicting demands what you should be doing. We saw that it's a good idea to put um, long files towards the end. But on the other hand, you should put towards the end also files that are seldom needed. So you have two pressures. One is wants you to put infrequent files to the, towards the end. On the other hand, the, uh, the other is that you want to put long files towards the end. And what about if a long file is frequently needed? Do you put it towards the end or towards the front? So we have to reconcile somehow the two requirements, right? Into a single quantity with respect to which you will act in a greedy way. What would you take? Yes. I have a question. If I can see in the previous example why I have a solution, what makes it greedy? So like, the greedy solution is, that's a good question. What makes this solution greedy? 
Well, uh, because the length of the file is multiplied by increasingly, by decreasing numbers, well, the greedy solution is to multiply n with the shortest possible file to try to minimize the products. But I give you that sometimes, you know, that sometimes uh, some algorithms don't quite exactly fit the description of the greedy. Maybe it's greedy with a, with a tweak. So all these names are kind of uh, a little bit vague also because we often, as we will see later, we often combine techniques uh, to achieve uh, uh, the goal, right? Okay, so now what would you uh, what would you choose? How would you sort the files? Yes. Uh, would you put the minimum product of PI and LI? Sorry? So you take the product of PI and LI and you minimize that? Okay, so the suggestion is to take the product of PI and LI. Now let's see. If LI is larger, we should put it towards the end. But if PI is larger, then you should put it towards the front. So the product is not good, but you are very close. If it's not a product, what would it be? The quotient. The quotient. So you divide uh, PI by LI, and you order the files according to the size of the quotient PI divided by LI. Now, if PI is larger, it will, you will put, it will push the, this file towards the front. And if LI is larger, then it will push it um, towards the end because it will decrease the, the quotient. So, now, why not, according to the uh, quotient of P squared divided by L squared? Why just P divided by L? P squared divided by L squared has exactly the same feature. Larger P increases this value, larger L decreases this value. Why exactly PI over LI? Well, the trick is, uh, you give it a try, and you see whether it works. Maybe, in fact, you have to take squares. So again, uh, I, you, I want you to appreciate that there is a lot of trial and error when you solve difficult, uh, uh, difficult problems, but hopefully, with your trials and errors, you actually refine your solution, and eventually you get the right one. So now, um, what we can do is, uh, if you have a long list of uh, files, any order can be obtained if you swap only two adjacent files, uh, right? So any order, just like bubble sort, uh, any order can be accomplished from any other order if you always swap only the adjacent uh, files. Why do we do adjacent files? Because if you swap adjacent files, nothing from before and nothing after these two files will change. So it will be easy to argue, right? So let us see how this works in this particular case, and then we will make a short break. So assume that uh, you sorted the files uh, from L1 all the way up to uh, Ln. So the, you put at the end, end, end file. And then assume that somewhere here inside, you swap two files. Uh, let's see what we have. Let's compare the expected time of the original ordering with the expected time after the swap. 
and see in what circumstances swapping reduces the expected time, right? Because in this way, um, just as in bubble sort, uh, you will be able to accomplish any configuration. So let's see. Uh, so this will be, of course, the expected time before the swap. It's uh, uh, expected. So the time for L1 is just, for first file is just L1. You multiply it with uh, its probability to get the expected time, retrieval time of the first time, of the first file plus. Now, the time to read the second file is, of course, L1 plus L2. You multiply it with P2 to get uh, the expected value of the read, and so forth, right? Now, if you swap here the file K with the file K plus 1, let's see how things change. Well, because the two files are adjacent, nothing on the left uh, will change. Uh, so up to k minus 1, nothing changes. Then instead of k file, you will have k plus first file. And the uh, uh, reading time will be sum of all lengths, right, up to k minus 1. Because we took out the k file, the next length will be lk plus 1. Plus, now comes file k. And what files do you have to read in order to read the k file? You read all the files up to k minus 1 as before. Then you read the k plus first file, because now it comes first, before k. And then you read the k file. And again, nothing to the right changes. Uh, and that's the reason why we consider adjacent files. Now, let's subtract from E uh, the expected time E prior to swapping minus the expected time after swapping. So the, um, the time will be reduced if this quantity is positive, if E is bigger than E prime. But now notice, everything before, up to file pk is exactly the same, so they will all cancel out when you subtract. Now, what do we have um, here that we do not have here? Well, here we have pk plus 1 times uh, lk, right? Because now, um, let me see, is this the one... LK times PK plus 1. There is nothing uh, here to cancel it because LK is missing here, right? And vice versa, what you have here and you don't have above is LK plus 1 times PK, right? Because PK here doesn't have LK plus 1. All other terms cancel out, so you get just this difference. But when will be this positive? It will be positive if this quantity is larger than that quantity here. And if you divide by LK times LK plus 1 both sides, because they are positive quantities, um, then you get that uh, um, PK plus 1 divided by LK plus 1 will be larger than PK divided by LK. So the, the swap will reduce the expected time just in case, right, um, just in case this quantity for the K file is smaller than the quantity of this file, even though uh, this file, right, uh, was after um, K uh, file despite the fact that it had larger quotient. So if you have inversion in terms of this ratio, then uh, removing the inversion will reduce uh, uh, the expected time. So this is another 
method how you see optimality and this calculus even if you didn't know what the criterion should be you simply test under what circumstances swapping will reduce the expected time you go through this calculation and lo and behold uh, you get these uh, uh, quotients just by analyzing under what circumstances the expected time drops. So there is a variety of tricks uh, how you both design and how you prove correctness of the greedy algorithms and it takes practice to um, kind of get a good feeling what is the quantity you should be greedy with and how to verify that in fact uh, your solution produces optimal, uh, that, that it is an optimal solution. Okay, let's make now a five minute break and then we will see more examples.